What if the major events of the Bible looked different than you imagined them? As a kid, I would read my children's Bible. I would hear Bible stories at church. But when I actually started to read these stories for myself, when I looked at the original language and the context of these stories, I realized that they looked very different than what I had imagined. And today, I'm going to share five of those moments with you. Five Bible moments that will look quite different than you ever imagined in this episode of Misreading Scripture. Most of the time, when we imagine the calling of Jesus' disciples, we imagine scenes like when Jesus calls Peter and Andrew to be his disciples. At some point, Jesus passed by these men and invited them to join this elite group of followers. But Mark's gospel actually gives us a different perspective on this. He says, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach and have authority to drive out demons. The way that Mark records this event gives us the impression that rather than selecting his disciples sporadically throughout his journeys, he instead spends the first portion of his ministry gathering a loose band of followers from whom he selects the twelve. It tells us that apparently there were some people who didn't get picked. For some reason, they didn't have what it took to be among the twelve. What makes this even more interesting, though, is Judas' presence in this story. Mark tells us that among the twelve chosen disciples is Judas Iscariot. Strange, isn't it? For some reason, Judas is chosen above other men. Maybe Jesus knew the purpose that Judas would serve in the end and chooses him for that reason. Or perhaps Judas was quite a different person at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Either way, this moment in Mark's Gospel gives us a much different picture of what it looked like to become one of the twelve disciples. It's not what we imagined. One of the things that you'll notice as you read through the Gospels is that Jesus is very selective about where he speaks. In fact, one of the most common places we find Jesus teaching is next to water. And there's a very good reason for this. In a world before microphones and speaker systems, the only way to amplify sound was to find those places that did it naturally. And water was perfect for this. But this actually changes how we imagine a moment like Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount. For most of us, whenever we have imagined this moment, we've pictured Jesus standing or sitting high atop a mountain with crowds of people scattered below him. And that's because, at least in the 21st century, that's how we're used to preachers speaking to us. They stand on high and we sit below. But that's not how Jesus would have preached, especially not in a location like this. Teaching near the shoreline, as he was, Jesus never would have preached from above. He would have lost all of the benefit of the acoustics of the water. Instead, Jesus would have stood below and his crowds would have been above him on the hillside. Imagine, if you will, the setup of an amphitheater. The arrangement allows for the sound of the one below to carry up to the people above. This is also true of the character of Jesus. Rather than placing himself above the crowds, the Son of Man chooses to be the lowest of all. If you've heard the story of Jesus' death and resurrection, then you're probably familiar with Peter's experience that night. At the Last Supper, Jesus says that one of the disciples will betray him, and Peter proclaims that he will die for Jesus. But Jesus disputes him. He says that before the cock crows, Peter will deny him three times. And as Jesus is on trial before the Sanhedrin, that's exactly what happens. Three times, people address Peter, claiming that he is a disciple of Jesus, and three times, Peter denies it. And right as Peter is denying it for the last time, the cock crows. Now, if you're anything like me, you've probably imagined that a rooster was standing somewhere around this courtyard and began to give this morning call as these events unfolded. In fact, some translations actually say that a rooster crowed. But that's not necessarily what happened. You see, the phrase translated cock crow would be the Hebrew phrase kerot hagaver. It literally means the call of the cock. But in Hebrew, gaver is also the word for man. And this explains the idiom that formed around this phrase. You see, at the time of Jesus, the night was divided into multiple shifts, 
And during one of those shifts, sometime between midnight and three, the Karot Hagaver, a cock crier, would blow a horn signaling the changing of the temple guard. We actually see something similar recorded in the Mishnah. In Sukkah 5.4, it tells us that at cock crow, they blew a sustained, a quavering, and another sustained blast. This actually gives us quite a different picture of what happened when Peter betrayed Jesus. Jesus was telling Peter that he would hear a familiar sound, a sound that everyone knew was coming. It was a sound that would occur in the middle of the night, not the break of dawn. And it wasn't going to be the sound of an animal welcoming the new day. It would be the sound of horns, the changing of the guard, a sound that would show him that this was the opportunity to remain faithful to Jesus. And it now was officially over. When we see images of Pentecost, the disciples are almost always hidden away in a tiny room, perhaps still hiding after the crucifixion of Jesus. But this is actually quite different from how these events would have actually taken place. You see, the first thing that we learn as we begin Acts 2 is that the events that unfold occur on a day called Pentecost. And what many of us don't realize is that this was actually a Jewish holy day. In fact, it was one of the three most important religious holidays on the Jewish calendar. Three times a year, Jewish people from around the world were required to travel to Jerusalem to worship. On other holidays, they could worship from home. But on these particular three, if they were able, they had to travel. Pentecost was one of these three. Its Hebrew name is Shavuot. So on this particular day, there would have been tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of people in Jerusalem. These people would have been from different parts of the world, speaking different languages. And several times each day, these people would have gathered together at the temple to worship. This is actually what Luke is referring to when he says that the disciples were all sitting in a house. House is a word that was commonly used to refer to the temple, the house of God. And with this in mind, this actually changes everything about how we imagine this scene. Now, rather than imagining the disciples traveling from a locked room into crowded streets once the Holy Spirit arrives, we picture them in the temple, surrounded by people speaking a host of languages, filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking the truth that everyone can somehow understand. And as we picture this, we begin to get a sense of what's really happening here. You see, Shavuot was a feast to celebrate Moses receiving the covenant from God on Mount Sinai. The people inside the temple would have been listening to the reading of Exodus 19 to 20. As they listened to this story of God's presence appearing to Moses like fire, they would have also heard the reactions of people who at that very moment were experiencing God's presence like fire. In an instant, God was declaring a powerful message about what was to come, not just to a handful of people in a room or random people in the street, but to all of Israel gathered together. God was showing them that the covenant established with Moses was being renewed. The people would be saved, but that hope would now come not in stone tablets on a mountainside, but through the death and resurrection of God's own son. Jesus. The beasts we read about in the book of Revelation are particularly terrifying, and Revelation 13 is no exception. Verses 1 to 2 say, And I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on its horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. Now, one thing that immediately stands out about the beast in this passage is how similar it is to a beast described in Daniel 7. Daniel says, Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. And after that, I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. The reason these two images are so similar is because both Daniel and John are writing in the apocalyptic style. This is a style of literature that was prevalent in the few centuries before and after Jesus. And one of the hallmarks of apocalyptic imagery was its dramatic use of images and symbols to describe the experiences of God's people. The people writing books like Daniel and Revelation were going through great and terrible persecution. 
They used images and symbols to convey the intensity of their persecution and the magnificence of their future redemption. And understanding that actually helps us to understand these terrifying images and symbols in Revelation 13. For instance, in apocalyptic literature, beasts always represent nations, and horns always represent either people in power or the power that they exercise. So when John describes this terrifying beast in Revelation 13, we realize that he's talking about those in power who are oppressing Christians. In apocalyptic literature, numbers also often have meaning. Seven represents perfection or completeness. Ten refers to totality or to all of something. And since Revelation 12 ends by talking about Satan, what we realize is that John is telling us that these beasts represent those in power who are serving Satan by oppressing Christians. This changes everything. John isn't describing a literal beast that will rise forth from the sea. He's talking about something much more scary and much more real. Those in power who not only harm the community of faith, but as John reveals in the rest of chapter 13, also lead the people to worship things other than God. It's not just a promise of something that will happen at some future date. It's a prophecy about something that happened to Christians thousands of years ago and is still happening right now. You see, this is what we realize when we truly dive into the scriptures and look closely at what they say. We realize that not only do the events in scripture look different than we might imagine them, in many cases, they also mean something different than what we formerly believed. In fact, that's why I created a series called Beyond the Words, which helps you to understand the context and the details of scripture in such a way that actually makes it easier to read and will help you to see it with an entirely new set of eyes. So, if you're interested in that, we are actually in the middle of a series right now on the book of Revelation. Just take a moment and click this link right here, which will take you to the first video in our Revelation series. And if you're interested in more of these misreading scriptures, like the video you watched today, you can click this other link right here. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week. And until next time, God bless.